Hello, my name is Pastor Joel Silverman. Thank you for watching the Regeneration Church broadcast. It's my hope that through this message, you are encouraged and made stronger in Jesus Christ and the truth of his word. Enjoy this message and may God richly bless you. Praise God. So let's just pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, that it goes, it falls onto good soil. God, fertile soil, that this church is in a place of germination and regeneration. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, um, all of you know by now that I move prophetically. I am a prophet. I move apostolically. I am an apostle. And um, I, I, I understand that God is raising up a standard. And this morning I was waiting on the Lord. I had so many things to share. And I really said, God, what do you want me to share? And he took me back to a word that I shared in 2012. And in a, in a sequence of seasons over a period of time, I realized that most of the things that we receive as prophetic people are things that we need to speak about for a time. Amen. We don't get, I don't get sermon outlines. I'm not one of those guys that get a sermon outline. I get prophetic download, and then I have to minister out of that propheticness and what God is saying. So if you're writing, you're making notes, that you need to write this down. The voice of faith brings you into your breakthrough. The voice of faith brings you into your destiny. The voice of faith brings you into your victory. Yes. You see, we can all be part of the word of faith, and we can read the word, which is what we need to do, but we need to put a voice to the word. We need to attach faith to the word. Amen. Come on. We need to look at these words like uh, Roland read this morning. He read a word that was full of power, but we need to put a voice to the word he read. In other words, we need to start to speak the word of the Lord, because when I go to Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews. And I'm just going to lay some foundation because I really believe God wants to break you out of your mold. God wants to break you out of your, um, it's almost like a religious thinking that you have to suffer. I don't know where we get that from. It's not in the Bible. Amen. Because our sufferings, you cannot compare to the sufferings of Christ. Jesus has already suffered enough for us to walk in absolute liberty. Amen. Come on. I walk in liberty. I'm, I'm, I'm not bound to my past. I am subject to my future. And according to Jeremiah 29, 11, my future is good. How about yours? Amen. Amen. How about your future? Your future good? Amen. Amen. My future's good. My future's good. Because the Bible says the, the plans and dreams and future events I have for your life are good and not for destruction. So when I follow the timeline of God, I realize that God has been where I have never been before. God has been to 2050, Carol. And he said, 2050 is good because I've been there. Amen. Come on. So if God has set much peace about our future, why don't you? And so that's why I love the prophetic so much because the prophetic will launch you onto a journey of excessive blessing. Prophecy was never meant to bring you a curse. Any prophet that comes into your life and curses you and puts a curse on you and puts something heavy on you that you can't bear wasn't God because the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus. Amen. So let's see what Hebrews chapter 4 says in the Bible. Verse 12. Are you all there? On page 1428. And I want to just say this. If you're ever looking for somebody to give a job to, I'll take the job. If you've got any um, employment forms, I'll come and fill them in. I want to tell you, you are an exciting church to be around. Amen. This is a new wineskin and a new wine time. You need to embrace that today. Amen. Now listen to what the word says. It says here in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, make it, making it active. How many of you know that the, the, the power of God is active? The Word of God is active. It's continuous. It's active and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating in the dividing line of the breath of life and the immortal spirit and joints and marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. That's the Word of God. 
The word of God is speak is is that God speaks is alive. Now let me ask you a question. When we look at the Bible, how many of you know that God's already spoken this word? When we get the word, when you study the word that says that by a two-edged sword, the Bible is a two-edged sword, once spoken by God and then once spoken by man makes it double-edged. Think about that. It's double-edged. And so there's a power associated to the Word. And so what I want to speak about this morning is the fact that we need not just to read the Word, but we need to get into practice of speaking the Word, of declaring the Word, of decreeing the Word. For example, many times when I prophesy and I speak a prophetic Word, there's times that it's not just the Word associated with the faith that I have, but it's the words associated with declaration or decreeing. Amen? Come on. You shall declare decree a thing and it will be established is that prophetic yes how many times do you you know many times in our life we walk by faith and not by sight and many times as i said to lisa the other day many times in my own life i may not have a prophetic word but i have a decree and i have a declaration to make by faith decreeing it decreeing it for such a time as this amen come on decreeing it and many times you know prophetic people decree a thing and say well and we then we say well that wasn't prophecy well it is prophecy it's all part of prophecy prophecy is the spoken word prophecy is the word spoken in the supernatural realm amen imparted through divine inspiration amen come on and so I've learned some things. God wants to ignite faith in you. He wants to ignite faith on the inside of you for you to speak. So your mouth speaks. Amen. Come on. Because out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we can ignite faith in you. Your mouth will start to speak the word of the Lord. Instead of speaking all the stuff the devil wants you to speak. Stop speaking your lack. Start to speak your abundance. Stop speaking your sickness and start to speak your healing. So to stop, stop speaking what the enemy wants you to speak. Because I've come to understand something as I've traveled. I travel a lot. I've come to understand there's a lot of noise. When I sit in airports, I realize that I have to sit really close to where I can hear everything because people are speaking, planes are taking off, uh, um, the, you know, the, uh, the people are on the intercom, there's all sorts of going on in, in, in around the airport and I have to be sure I can hear when they call my flight. The same dynamics um, happen in your own life. You and I can be so busy that all the noise that's going on around us brings unbelief and fear and, and just the noise of life. How many of you know that you're doing life? How many of you are doing life? Three of you. That's good. How many of you are doing life? All of us are doing life. And in doing life, there's a noise. And many times the noise of life drowns out the voice of God. Amen. Come on. Because I learned many years ago, there's a difference between hearing and listening. I have three kids, and I'm, I mean, there's years, there are times that I've said to Jonathan and Daniel when they were still in my house, go and clean your room. Yes, Daddy. Say, Daniel, have you cleaned your room? Yes, Daddy. And I'm one of those fathers. I do inspections. And I go up into the room, open the door. It's like, huh? Daniel, did you clean your room? No, Daddy. Well, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. He didn't hear me. He listened to the noise. But he didn't hear my voice. And some of you are trying to live your life in this realm of noise and you haven't heard his voice. You've been listening to all sorts of stuff. And then prophetic key people come in and because there's a noise in your head, there's a noise in your emotions, there's a noise in your life, you're not hearing the word of the Lord. And yet the voice, the spoken voice of faith will bring your victory. When you start to put a voice to faith, it will bring your victory. Come on. I really believe that we're in a season where we need to hear the right voice. What is God saying right now to this church? I'm not here to preach a message about what God wants you to do individually as well as what God is saying to the church. God has got this church on a track. You're on a flight plan. God has an end result. God has all sorts of um, desired results for you down this track. But we all corporately need to start to hear what God is saying. This is not about my individual need being met. This is about the corporate need of the church being met. Amen. 
coming into corporate alliance, coming into alliance with God, coming into alignment with His Word. Amen? So I believe we're in that season. God wants you to know. He wants you to know. Amen. God wants you to God wants to fulfill you. He wants to give you destiny and purpose. What's the use of walking around church, being in church and never knowing your purpose and never knowing your destiny and never knowing that there's an end result that 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 in this beautiful plan of God that the moment he you got conceived that God was excited according to Psalms 139 said, "Hey, you know what? There's a child conceived and they're going to be born in 1946 whatever." Amen. Not looking at you, Joel. I'm just giving it the date. Amen. And, and so God was, you know, and, and then God says, you know what? I, I, I put them together. I knitted them together in their mother's womb. And, and, and they were embroidered. And he speaks it beautifully in, in Psalms 139. And then it says, and I've written everything about their life. All their destiny is written in this book. And then we go to Ephesians chapter 1 and it says, you are, be, you are foreordained and you've been predestined to enjoy the purposes of heaven. And so we read all this and we realize that God wants you to fulfill destiny. Listen to me. We all want to be part of the purpose. I, all, I want to be part of the purpose. Come on. And when you can discern His voice, you will know His kingdom. Listen to this. When you hear His voice, we all want our destiny. How many of you want destiny? But let me tell you right now, you can't fulfill your destiny unless you understand His kingdom. The only way you understand his kingdom is to discern his voice. <laughs> Come on. By the sound of the voice of somebody close to you, you'll know their heart. The voice of faith declares and reveals the heart of faith. Church, listen to me. This is revelation. I've realized that we all want to know our destiny. We want to know our purpose. We want to know our gifting. And you know what the sad thing is? We don't know His voice. And because we haven't heard His voice, we can't discern His kingdom. But when you can discern His kingdom, all the other things will be made clear. That's why He says, seek first my kingdom and all these other things will be made available to you. But guess what? It comes to understanding His voice. Have you heard His voice? Is this making sense? For example, when I go home to my family, it's such an amazing thing. If I walk through my front door on Monday and, my, and a voice spoke to me and it wasn't my wife, I'll be running. I'll be out of there like nothing. Why? Because it's not her voice. What's this foreign woman doing in my house? But if my wife opens the door or I walk in the house and I say, honey, I'm home and I hear the voice of D, what happens? I know I'm back in my house. I assimilate the voice I heard or the voice I'm hearing to the kingdom I'm living in. So what voice are you hearing? Whose voice are you assimilated to? Know His kingdom, you'll know His purpose. But it has to come through hearing His voice, hearing His word, getting in His word, hearing His word, speaking His word back to Him. And the more you speak His word back to Him, the more you're going to hear an echo of His love and His joy. You're going to know what it is. Amen? Come on. So, so you and I must break free from the echoes of the past. Break free from the echoes of the past. Many people in church live in an echo chamber of the past. Most times when I'm ministering to people, all I'm hearing is an echo of their past. Oh, in 19 so-and-so, all the people. Listen, stop allowing people to remind you of your past. Stop allowing the enemy to come and remind you of the stuff of your past. And because every time we, 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 we are reminded by the echo, that echo comes in, we then resuscitate the echo. We resuscitate the past. And by resuscitating the past, we never step into the future. We never step. That's why I love the prophetic so much. Because the prophetic is more about your future than your past. And if God gives you a word about your past, usually it's a word of knowledge. And then he gives you a word of wisdom, how to get rid of the past. Stop living in your echo chamber because an echo is a shadow sound that sounds like the truth. You can go and have a look. That's defined right there. An echo is a shadow truth that sounds like the truth. 
It's an echo sound. When you stand, when you stand in the Grand Canyon, how many of you been to the Grand Canyon? And you, sa- and you shout the words, and it comes back to you. You don't get the whole sentence back. You just get the, the back side of the sentence back. It's a shadow sound that sounds like the truth, but it's not. Amen. And when God speaks, it's not an echo. It's direct and intentional. And God is speaking loud and clear. Amen. Come on. So many people in church live in the echo chamber of the past. Thoughts and real life experiences that they, they consistently resuscitate and it keeps them in the place of bondage. We need to break free once and for all. Listen to me. You know, when we pray, can we stop praying about being healed and wanting to be healed? And can we stop praying about trying to destroy the devil and defeat the devil? He's already defeated. We spend so much time on how to figure out how to defeat the devil. Jesus has already defeated the devil. Given you all authority. And what we try and do, we try and get back to the cross and we, and we, start to, uh, we dictate the cross's power by our mindset and our inability to understand the power of the cross. Stop doing that in your prayer life. Start to understand that the devil has already been put under your feet. That you have all authority and the authority that you need to walk in is in your mouth. Get the word of God in your spirit and in your mouth and sort of speak with authority those things. Let me give you an example. It happened to me. One day I was praying in my office and I was buying in the devil. And there was spit everywhere. I bind you devil and I'm and I and I'm just gonna destroy and, and God give me authority. And you know what the Lord said to me? Excuse me. What are you doing? I said, I'm binding the devil. He said, the devil's bound. I've already taken the keys of life and death. Focus on what you are. Focus on the fact you have victory. Focus on the fact that I've given you my word. Focus on the fact that you have an inheritance. Focus on the fact that you're already a king and a priest. Focus on the fact that you have deliverance. Focus on the fact that you healed. Focus on the fact that you've been delivered and set free. Focus on the fact that you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. But every now and then you masquerade and you masquerade with the name of Jesus. You haven't put Jesus on yet. Put Jesus on. Take off the mask. So the church is coming into a place of maturity. The voice of faith will give you your breakthrough. Start to put a voice to your dream. Start to put a voice to your vision. Start to put a voice to your deliverance. Start to put a voice to everything you need to happen in your life right now. Amen. Come on. Put a voice to your barrenness. Put a voice to your inconsistency. Put a voice to all the fear. Put a voice, because the voice that you put to fear is the antidote to fear. It's called faith. How about putting a voice to your inconsistency? Put a voice to your lack. This lady with the glasses over here, what's your name? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How does your garden grow? I'll tell you what God wants to say to you today. Start put a voice, put a voice of victory over your brother. Amen. Start to put a voice of victory over your finances. Start to put a voice of victory over all the things that have been inconsistent in your life. Amen. Have you got a brother? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, do you have financial issues? Well, don't you think you need to put a voice to it? Yeah. (laughs) What do you got an issue with this morning? Put a voice to it. If you're not feeling like, you know, God doesn't love me, how can God love me? This is what some of you are thinking. I'm not going to point you out, but I'm just going to stand here because this is where you're sitting. You've been thinking that God doesn't love you. That's why you can't respond to him. Why don't you put a voice to the lie and change it? Amen. Come on. A lot of noises going on in your head. It's not God. God, Jesus said those that hear my voice, not voices. So what voice are you hearing? 
because the amount of, uh, let me just say it like this, in, in, in terms of the voice you're hearing is the voice that'll come out of your mouth. It's the sound that'll come out of your mouth. If you're hearing continuous voices of unbelief, guess what you'll speak? Unbelief. And in this season of this church, you and I cannot afford to speak unbelief. You need to start speaking belief. This church is not going to die on the vine. I can tell you that right now. God will grow this church with or without the leadership. I can tell you that right now. God will do it. Why? Because this place has become a place of meeting. God is just looking for a couple of people. Just tell the president I'm busy. <laughs> Psalms 40. Let's go to Psalms 40 real quick. Is that okay? Yes. Psalms 40. Don't you just hate it when that happens in church? And it's your phone? <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? That, God always, that, you know, I, I say to people, put your phone off, and then it's my phone that rings. I have to check it again. Okay, it's off. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen. Can you just give me a little bit more volume, please? I'm just, I need just a little bit more volume. Okay. It says, I waited patiently. This is Psalms 40, verse 1, on page 631. <laughs> just say, God, Lord, just say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Give, me the voice of faith. give me the voice of faith. I need faith. I need faith. And faith comes through hearing, hearing and hearing the? Word. What word? Whose word? God's word. So why don't we just get back to faith again? Amen. All these guys talking around, well, we don't want the faith movement and the faith. Well, you were, you were born again by faith. You live by faith. How many of you live by faith? I live by faith. Now listen to this. I waited patiently. That's a good thing to do right there. Psalms 40 verse 1. I waited patiently and expectantly for the Lord and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He inclined his ear to me. He inclined to me. I waited upon him. I spoke to him. I cried out to him. And he inclined his ear. Let me tell you this morning prophetically. God is inclining his ear to you. He's hearing you. He's hearing your cry. He's hearing your cry. But you're going to have to start crying the word of the Lord to him. Not your self-pity. God doesn't get moved by self-pity. Real quick. Amen. And then it says something very powerful here. It says, He drew me up out of a horrible pit, a pit of tumult and destruction, and of miry clay, froth and slime, and set my feet upon a rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. He put me on the rock, steadying my steps and establishing my goings. And He has put a new song. Now listen to this. This is like crazy stuff. This is like God. This is like crazy. Because when you read this, it's like, you know, he's put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and fear and put their trust and confidence and reliance in the Lord. Now, how do people get fearful and put their confidence in the Lord when they hear a song? It's the word of God. Amen, brother. When you put the word of God in your mouth, people will start to recognize it and they'll become confident in your confidence. They'll be confident in your faith. They'll become confident in the word of God in your mouth. Hallelujah. Woo! Instead of you just speaking all the stuff you speak, you start singing a new song. People are going to start to get fearful of God because they'll say, how come she's singing a new song when she's going through all the stuff? There must be a God in heaven because she's not, she's not anticipating failure. She's anticipating great results. How come that is? God must be great. Wow, we're going to bow our knee to God. Hallelujah. Instead of walking around saying, oh, well, you know, I'm the black sheep in the family and, you know, I'm black and I'm white and I'm from New York and I'm from the inner Bronx and uh, God can't touch me. I'm just South African and I, you know, I've heard all the excuses under the sun. <coughs> Every excuse. God says, you know what? You must, <clears throat> you my son, you my daughter. It's enough. You're mine. You beautiful thing, you. You're mine. You're awesome. You like the awesomeness of awesome. All I want you to do is get into agreement with me. Will you just get into agreement with me, you beautiful thing, you? Will you just start speaking my word over your circumstances and watch me change it? Get out of speaking the stuff you're speaking. Don't think church is going to be boring. 
Because some of you think, well, I'm just going to go, it's going to be nice because it's boring. It's not going to be boring. God's actually going to start doing signs, wonders, and miracles around you. Amen. Signs, wonders, and miracles are going to start to break up around you. You're going to walk into, into some shopping centers. I can't. Do you guys have Harry's Teeter here? Where do you do your shopping? Kroger's? <laughs> stop and shop. I like that. That's like a marketing deal right there. Stop and shop. When you walk into stop and shop, you're going to stop the shoppers from shopping. <laughs> Amen? Because when you walk in there, the Word of God is so powerful in you that when you see an inconsistency in the natural realm, God says, hey, you know what? That's inconsistency. I never meant that to be like that in the natural realm because I'm perfect. I want that to be perfected. Will you get, uh, will you get into a line with my Word and speak into it in aisle 9? Yes, God, I'll go to aisle 9 and I'll find that person you want me to speak over. So the, the whole Christianity walk in your life takes on a whole new perspective because you're starting to see it and hear it from God's perspective, not your perspective. Hallelujah. And people say to you, can't you speak anything? Uh, can't you? You know, people have said to me, can't you just be a little negative? No, I can't be negative. Oh, are you always this excited? Yes. Are you always this exuberant? Yes. Why? Because the Word has come to live on the inside of me. And every time I speak His Word, the kingdom of heaven manifests. Yes. Woo! Yeah. Instead of walking around with a long face. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Double. Double God for her trouble. Double recompense. Amen. In Jesus' name. Woo! Yeah. Come on. David had to get delivered from his fear. Do you know that David was fearful? When you read the Psalms, the dude, every Psalm the guy wrote was about the, my foe. They're about to encompass me. They're about to kill me. I'm about to go down into hell. There was a fear thing on David until he started to worship. And later in his life, God broke it off him. He started to realize worship was better than sacrifice. But some of us have walked in sacrifice, and then we want to worship from a place of sacrifice. Stop. Get into a place of obedience. Get into a place of obedience before you get into the place of sacrifice. You can't worship from a place of sacrifice because you always think it's about you and your pain. Sort of move from a place of where Jesus delivered you, get into a place of healing and restoration, and live out of that place of victory. I am victorious. I am healed. Greater is he in me than he that is in the world. Will you go through war? Yes. But guess what? You don't have to fight it. <laughs> He's already won the war. It's almost unfair. I get to wear the tunic of victory, but I didn't fight the war. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> some of you are so tired of fighting he's the devil's war and the devil says fight me all you want because I'm going to get you so distracted that you will forget the kingdom of heaven wow. stop fighting get into rest come on come on get into rest listen if you don't have hope for your future you will not have power for your present let me say that again if you don't have hope for your future, you will not have power for your present. I got that at 6.15 this morning. Stop trying to function out of your dysfunction. It'll never happen. Start to get hope for your future. And as you get hope for your future, God will start giving you power for your present. God will give you a great future. Start to just hear the word of the Lord. That's why I love the prophetic so much. I don't care who says what about the prophetic. I'm telling you today, I've seen more power, more creative results by the power of God's word than anything else. And God wants to do it in you. I'm not the only one that can prophesy. All of you here can start to move prophetically. God wants you to put the voice, his word in your mouth. When you start to put the word in your mouth, you start prophesying. Amen. Okay, that's just my introduction. <laughs> the main thing is, can I just share this? I don't know if I've shared this the year before, but uh, let's just, 
let's just look at some things here. I, I believe it's so inf- important that we have a voice of faith, start to speak the vision, start to speak the dream. Now, can I just say this? Individually, let's start to speak life over each other's lives. You know, for, for example, if I have Charles come to my house, and I'm going to pray that you do one day, the first thing that I will, uh, the first place I will take Charles to is my living room. How many of you know that's important? The last place that I would not want to take Charles to is my basement. I remember when I lived on Long Island, we had a basement. My basement was terrible. Everything that was we didn't want went in the basement. My basement was full of spiders. My basement was full of water. It stank. I hate my basement. You know, we didn't even send the kids down in the basement. I mean, that is the last place I'll take Charles to. But how come when we meet people, we take them to the basement of our lives? How come it is in church circles, it's norm that when we meet somebody, the first place we want to take them to is the basement of our soul. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to take this person to the living room of my soul. Because the place that I would take Charles to is my living room. In our living room, um, Charles, we have everything. Uh, everything's bright. There's big couches. There's a big screen TV. Everything we've eaten is a trophy on the wall because I, li- I love deer on rice. So all that stuff is, is on the wall. We have big pictures. It's bright. There's music. There's flowers. Our living room is full of life. That's where I want to take you to. How many of you think that the world wants to visit your basement or your living room? But because we live in this place of noise and unbelief and, and, and we don't really understand God and we don't really believe His Word, we continuously take people to the wrong room of our lives. And then there's another, another area to this house. It's called rooftop living. How many of you live in a house with, with a balcony? I remember in, in Australia, we had a house with a balcony. And I would get out on the balcony and get up on the roof and look up, get up right on the roof and stand looking over this whole valley, the Toowoomba Valley. It was called, it's actually called the bread basket of, of Australia where they grew all the, all the most amazing vegetables. And I would stand up there on the roof because I wanted to see it from a different perspective. When you meet somebody this week, I pray that you would take them into the living room of your life. Stop taking people and yourself into the basement of your past. Step out over the balcony of life and start to take a risk by faith and say, God, do you know what? I want to start to see it from your perspective. Start to prophesy it into that perspective. Does that make sense? Come on. It's so, it's so important that we see it from another perspective of where you live. Amen. Can you see what God's seeing? When you start to speak His Word, you'll start to see it the way God sees it. He doesn't see it the same way you say it. Because the Word says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So can we change that in, 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 you know, in our journey? What perspective are, are others seeing? Listen to this. What perspective of your life are others seeing when you open your mouth? Oh, I love Jesus. But when you open your mouth, it's trash. Oh, I surrender all. But when you open your mouth, there's no surrender at all. There's pride. We sing all the songs, but we don't live consistently to the word of the Lord. You see, prophecy will bring you into the right perspective. Amen? Amen. Come on. Now, I'm not saying if as leaders we see something wrong, we address it and we address it with the Word of God and we address it so that we can see change. I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking about life, that you have a choice. You and I have a choice today to change the destiny of our lives. Do you know that the decisions you are making today, the language you're using today, are defining your children's lives? Everything you speak are defining somebody else's life. The way you do your church, the way you do leadership, the way you do life, the way you do marriage, the way you speak to each other as husband and wife, you are defining each other's worlds. I've been married 28 years and I want to tell you, one of the most powerful things that Dee has spoken over my life every single day is that she loves me. You're an awesome husband. You're so awesome. You hunk of flesh, you. That's to find my world. I'm not looking for another woman. I'm not looking for somebody else to speak niceties and sweet things over my life. It's coming from the person that loves me. 
Come on. I'm speaking over my, my daughter that's 17. I'm not going to allow some 17-year-old jerk that's out there that can't get his hormones under control to speak over her life. I'm speaking over her life and saying, you are beautiful. You are passionate. You are my daughter. You are the king's daughter. You are beautiful. You don't have to look around and, and wait for somebody to tell you how beautiful you are. He believes you are beautiful. And I am going to get into agreement. So my daughter at age 17 has not had a date. Because she believes that she's beautiful. She doesn't have to look for some guy that's 17 years old to tell her how beautiful she is. Do you understand what I'm saying? My sons have the same um, a sense of excellence in their life. Amen? Come on. Amen. That's why it's important for you today to draw a line in the sand. We sang, that was such a prophetic song, my brother. To, God has drawn a line in the sand. How about you drawing a, drawing a line in the sand today and say, I am anointed, I am obedient, I am delivered, I am healed, I am joy, I am peace, I am more than enough, I am more than a conqueror. Come on, give God a hand. Amen. Amen. Come on. I am. I am. I'm going to start to fill my mouth because let me give you just um, the last thing I want to say this morning. Let's go to Mark 10. You know what? God's perspective is more important than your opinion. And you know what he thinks about you this morning? He thinks that you're awesome. He thinks that you're the most awesome thing on earth. There's some of you sitting here thinking, I'll never see God. I'm, I don't know how it's going to happen. Just change what comes out of your mouth. Just start to find a scripture. Find something in the word and get it inside of you. Even if it's the only scripture you know, just start to speak it and speak it and speak it and speak it and speak it until something happens. There's something that comes forth out of your mouth. Your mouth becomes. Do you know that the, the Hebrew word, there's a scripture that says, and faith comes by hearing. And that word speaking let me read it to you. Let me, read, let me find it real quick. I need, to, I need to show you this. Because in the Hebrew, um, I think it's in Romans. I actually wrote it down here somewhere. No, I didn't. Okay. Um, in Romans 9. I think it's in Romans 9. Let me just read this to you. I hope it's in Romans 9. That word they're speaking, or mouth, is actually is the Hebrew word um, that defines a weapon. Romans 10. Romans 10. Thank you, brother. Romans 10, verse um, yes, 9. You write on. Thank you. It says, because you, you acknowledge and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and in your heart believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes in, and so justified declares righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses. That word there, the mouth, and he confesses, that little bit there, if you go to the Hebrew, it actually says, the mouth, the front of your tongue, becomes a weapon. Whoa. Cool. Say, my mouth, my mouth. is the source, is the, source. Is the, sheath, is the sheath that holds the sword. That holds the sword. My, tongue my tongue is a weapon. Is a that's why you can cause other people to get all sorts of weird stuff happen because you use your mouth and the tongue as the wrong weapon. <laughs> mm, got really quiet. How about using your, your tongue this week as the weapon that ushers in His glory, that ushers in the prophetic, walk up to people and say, you know what, I'm going to speak life over this man. I'm going to speak life over her. That in, from this moment that her vertebrae will never come into disalignment, that she'll be healed. There's some of you that have been sitting around and you've been saying over and over yourself, I'll never amount to anything. I don't have what it takes. I've run out of steam. Stop saying that. So to say, God, I thank you that I've had a heart and I've prayed. It's your mouth. What are you speaking? Let's go to Mark, Mark 10 real quick. Mark 10. And I promise you I'll be finished by 10. No, I'm just going gonna, gonna to break that promise. Mark 10 real quick. Mark 10. Let's go to Mark 10. Are you guys okay? Do you think that this will help you? I'm telling you, this will help you. If you will just activate it and put it to work, it will help you. Yeah, we have an amazing, amazing, say amazing. amazing. This is an amazing um, um, example. Can you just open that for me? Chapter 10, verse 46. Listen to this. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. I'm telling you, 
Why have you designed your life? Because somebody else said, you must be this and you must do this. I told somebody this morning, I got the most amazing word. They don't know the word that I got this morning, how profound it was. The word I received this morning touched me in a place many, very few people can touch me. And God wants to touch some of you in places you've not touched, been touched before. But I'm telling you, the days of false identity is over. You need to start to believe who you are and take hold of your inheritance. Because this is an amazing story. Listen to this. In verse 46, it says, Then they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd. I love it about Jesus. Wherever Jesus was, there's a great crowd. Whenever Jesus is in a church, there will always be a great crowd. So stop worrying and saying, well, we don't want a big church. Well, if you don't want a big church, just tell Jesus not to come back. <laughs> but if you want a big church, just allow him to keep on coming and you will have a big church. Okay. That's how you build a church. And the other thing which is amazing in the scripture, oh, by the way, was the fact that he went and visited Jericho after Jericho was cursed. How many of you believe and, believe, and understand, remember that Jericho was cursed? It says that nobody would come to Jericho. Just when you think there are areas in your life God can't even visit, He comes up and shows up. <laughs> come on. It says there He was leaving Jericho. In other words, he, was, he had visited Jericho. And it says here, and there was a great crowd. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Do you see how this young man's um, um, sickness actually um, had an effect on his whole family? Reputation and association to unbelief is very powerful. I mean, are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, not only did they recognize him as a blind beggar, a blind beggar, but they said he is the son of Timaeus who was sitting by the roadside. In other words, whenever you walk in your spiritual blindness or your spiritual unbelief, it affects who you are, not only you, but your whole family. Listen, verse 47, and when he heard... Underline that in your Bible. This is Mark 10, um, Mark chapter 10, verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus, didn't see Jesus, didn't have the liberty or the, or, the, the, or the luxury of seeing Jesus, all he heard was, hey, there's Jesus coming down. I can hear them speaking to Jesus. And what does he do? It says, and when he st and we heard it was Jesus, he began to shout. He began to shout saying, Jesus, son of David, have pity and mercy on me now. What was he doing? He was having to shout his way through all the historical facts, all the historical truth, all the facts that not only was he a blind beggar, but you know what they did as well? In his custom and in the, in the place of um, their culture, because he was blind and he was a beggar, they made him a cloak. They made him a garment that he had to wear. So not only did they see him in the, in the natural being blind, but they recognized by his garment that he was wearing that he was from that family and he was a blind beggar. So get, how many of you know that this guy had a lot of reputation hanging on the, in the balance? That the reputation he had was one of a beggar and he could not see. So not only was he shouting out to Jesus to get Jesus' attention, but he was having to shout out of the barriers and the years and the years and the years of unbelief that pushed his faith right down into the dungeons of nothingness. And he had to start to shout. And as he shouted, it says he shouted all the louder, Jesus. God, what is he doing? He was pushing through the historical facts, the, the truths, the words, the, the accusations, the laughter, the mocking, the scorn that had been laid down on his life year after year after year. Listen to this. And it says, and many severely censored and reproved him, telling him to keep still. How many people in your life have told you, stop believing to fall pregnant? Stop believing for a wife. Stop believing to be, you'll never be prosperous. Do you know what they told me? When I started in, in ministry in 1991, they said, you'll never become, you'll never preach the gospel. You are too dysfunctional to be a preacher. I had a speech impediment. I, had dis, I was dyslexic. I couldn't read. I couldn't pr write properly. I couldn't pronounce words. And you know what? I shouted all the more. And this morning, I'm telling there's some of you here that you'll be shouting all the more. Jesus, you're my deliverer. 
I don't care what the doctor said. I'm telling you this morning, Jennifer, I don't care if you've not had any signs yet in your womb. I don't care about that. I care about the fact that every time I think of you, I share it with your folks this week. Every time I think about you, I see you pregnant. I see you holding a little boy. I see you pregnant. Even this morning when I came up and prayed for you. And I know what I said last year. This time next year you'll be pregnant. I declare that by faith. I declare it by faith. I don't care what happens in the natural. I don't care if your, your, your body, your mind, your soul is laughing at you and mocking you. I don't care about that. I care about the fact that in spite of all this, the reputation of you not being falling pregnant, the reputation in heaven is that you are. In Jesus' name. This morning when I was praying for you, the first picture that I saw was I saw you standing out with a big stomach like this. In Jesus' name. Just keep on crying out because that's what he did. It says, and many severely censored and reproved him, telling him to keep still. But he kept on shouting all the more, you son of David, have pity and mercy on me now. He was pushing through the historical facts. He was pushing through all the stuff that in inhibited him. It was almost like the betrayal of his family, the, the society, the culture, whatever it was. He was pushing through, pushing through like a little oak. How many of you know a big oak is a little nut that stood its ground? A big oak is a little nut that stood its ground. And some of you this morning may feel like a little nut, but let me tell you, in a few years, you're going to be a big oak. Hallelujah. And it says here, and it says here, and, and listen to this, and many severely censored him. And listen to this, verse 49. This is what I want you to see. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called him the blind man, telling him, take courage, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his outer garment, throwing off the garment of what? Of the past, of, you know, identity, throwing off the past, throwing off the, the cloak. It says he leapt up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want for me to do? And he said, I want my sight. But it took the voice of faith to stop Jesus. What is your, coming out of your mouth that's about to stop Jesus? Because let me tell you, when Jesus stops, there is absolute activity. There is healing. There is restoration. When you step, when you, <laughs> when you stop God, there's results. And I'm telling you, Angelica, you will see results. You are a miracle child. I was in this church when you were born. And I remember the, the picture your dad brought to the church. He brought a picture. If you don't know Charles, um, let me tell you the story, if that's okay. He brought a picture of a little baby who had no brain. And we prayed and sought God. The leadership of the church sought God. And let me tell you, a brain grew in this little girl. And today she's a functional human being. Because of the word of the Lord. And I'm telling you, she is special. She is special to God. And there's some of you that are looking at the circumstances of your life. If you would just start a minister and speak the word. Start to speak the word. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you would like to hear more, we encourage you to visit our website at regenerationchurchny.com. So if you're ever in the area, please stop by. We'd love to have you at our Regeneration Church Sunday service or our tender-hearted message on Monday night. Again, we thank you for watching and may God richly bless you.